a bank downtown to see if he could extract a couple of dollars from a failed bank account, not being able to do it. Uh, my extended family was first generation uh, immigrants, uh, uh, working class, uh, mostly unemployed, uh, uh, politically active uh, in the left organizations. Uh, the, the, uh, the striking, the, the objectively speaking, the situation was much worse than it is today. Uh, it's a far richer country than it was then, and all sorts of reasons. But the, the, the general attitude was quite different. There was an attitude of hopefulness, uh, looking forward, that we're somehow going to get out of this working together. A lot of it was the union movement. So, for example, I had uh, two maiden aunts who were very close. They came to visit all the time, seamstresses, unemployed. But they were members of the uh, ILCRI, you know, the International Ladies Garment Working Union, which provided a life for them. Uh, cultural activities, community, uh, uh, even a week in the Catskills. You know, uh, it, uh, it, was a, it was a life, a vibrant, exciting life. Uh, my, many of the people were formally uneducated. I mean, one of the biggest influences in my own life was uh, an uncle who had never gotten beyond fourth grade. Uh, work had a, he was disabled, so he was able to get a newsstand under the New Deal programs. He was probably the most educated person I've ever met in my life. Excited, interested in all sorts of things. There were lively worker education programs. Uh, people were discussing the, the latest uh, performance of the Budapest Swing. Yes, uh, Budapest Quartet, uh, Spring Quartet, uh, the Shakespeare play they saw in Central Park. And, so. and in general, the sense that somehow it's going to work. You know, we're doing things, we can get together. But what really made a difference was when the labor movement started to be constituted. I hate to say this to you because you know it a hundred times better than I do, but in the 1920s, of course, the labor movement had been virtually crushed. Uh, the Wilson Red Scare was the final blow after years of violent state repression of what had been a very vibrant labor movement. So in the 20s, it was almost gone. In the early 30s, it started to revive all sorts of ways. I mean, some of my earliest memories are riding in a trolley car. And I was in Philadelphia with my mother, you know, passing a textile mill where women workers were out on the picketing and security officers were beating them, beating them up outside. They were still there. Uh, but nevertheless, we're doing something. The strikes, strike waves, CIO organizing began. The strike waves began picking up. They started becoming militant. Militant doesn't mean fighting. It means changing things. But when it got to the level of sit-down strikes, you could see that the uh, owners, uh, the bosses, were really getting worried. I mean, a sit-down strike is one step before saying, we don't need you guys. We'll take over and run the factory ourselves. That's the end. Actually, the system of control is really very fragile. It uh, relies on submission. If submission is gone, you're in trouble. Uh, it's an insight that goes back as far as David Hume, first principles of government. Uh, it, uh, power is in the hands of the government if they decide to take it. So the control relies on consent. You withdraw your consent, it falls apart. Uh, as you've pointed out, uh, effectively, it does depend on having a relatively sympathetic administration. It's not going to come in and simply crush everyone with violence. So it does depend, and there was that in the 30s. You know, the Roosevelt administration was at least sympathetic, sometimes even forthcoming. 
So he had this combination of, you know, I remember my parents, you know, kind of sort of leftish Democrats, you know, my mother especially sitting Friday night, tuned to the radio for Roosevelt's uh, fireside address. You know, a radio program, I think it was Friday night. I'm just feeling, okay, the world's saved. We've got somebody who's gonna save us. Now that, along with the labor militancy, and what was provided by the labor movement and just in personal life, left an atmosphere of expectation that we're doing something, it's pretty rotten, we can go ahead, we're gonna have a life, we're gonna get out of this. Very different from today. I mean, I'm shocked by the level of hopelessness and despair. So just take the Sanders campaign, which was a remarkable success in many ways. It shifted the entire arena of debate and discussion well to the left. I mean, the Democratic Party formal program, couldn't have imagined as far back as the New Deal. Uh, uh, the representatives came in, uh, Sanders broke with over a century of American political history by, sh by showing you can become a viable candidate without relying on corporate sector and private wealth. All of this is an amazing success. As soon as he uh, didn't win in the primary, the young people especially just fell into deep depression. It's all over, we have to give up, what can we do? There was nothing like that in the 30s, or the 40s, or the 50s, or the 60s, certainly not the 60s. Well, sure, there'll be setbacks, but then you go on. Uh, when you make progress, there's regression, but you pick up from where you were and you go ahead. And this is a perfect time for that. It's easier to do it now than it's been for as far back as I can remember back to the 1930s. But somehow there's a sense you can't do anything. Uh, you can't fight City Hall. You're too strong, let's give up. Which is very frightening. I think it's the effect of 40 years of uh, neoliberal propaganda and strangulation, which has left, left people, of course, uh, I mean, you know, the, the uh, initiators of the neoliberal regression, basically the wealthy and the corporate sector, understood very well the role of labor in, in uh, carrying uh, progress forward. So their first moves, Reagan and Thatcher, two main figures, were to smash the labor move. Uh, Reagan uh, bringing in scabs is unheard of anywhere in the world except apartheid South Africa was soon picked up by the corporate sector. Uh, Thatcher uh, trying to smash the miners of Indian. Uh, the ideology is uh, there's no society, her famous statement, everybody's cast on the market alone, you know, the stock uh, organizations have to be destroyed, uh, everything has to be atomized. Uh, uh, Reagan starting in with the uh, uh, racist attack on uh, you know, his welfare queen's business, which trained a large segment of the population to believe that any form of government action is uh, uh, taking our tax money by our hard working you know, we work hard, pay taxes, and they give it away to these undeserving people. You get that all over the much of the South and the Midwest and other places. I mean, all of this is deep. Uh, the Democrats chimed in. Uh, Clinton made it worse. Uh, he picked it up and ran with it exactly in the wrong direction. It's been nothing since. Sanders is the first real break, and it's successful. Uh, but somehow that's led to a it's all led to a sense of depression. But you can see it in Europe as well, where there's a lot of rage, uh, resentment, uh, uh, some positive constructive activity, but it's kind of almost overwhelmed by the, the general sense of uh, everything's hopeless, let's tear everything down. It's a, it's a shocking thing, but it can be reconstituted just the way it was in the 30s. And so, one core element, I'm sure it's going to have to be a revival of the vibrant labor movement. And we're seeing that in interesting ways. So, so it began with the uh, T 
teacher strikes, which are very interesting. They're in places like where I live, Arizona, West Virginia, uh, very little labor organization, a lot of uh, very reactionary in many ways. The teachers are, I mean, Arizona has the lowest uh, spending per capita in education uh, after Mississippi, way down at the bottom. Uh, teachers are very poorly paid. The teacher strike began with a tremendous public support. Uh, their slogan is invest for ed. You see signs for it all over the place. And interestingly, their st the strikes went to the state legislature, big demonstrations. Uh, uh, they were partly calling for an improvement in the miserable wages. But the important point is that they were calling for exactly what the slogan says, invest in education. Let's create conditions under which our children can have a, a favorable educational environment, uh, decent classes, facilities, so on. There's even community efforts right here in poor communities, if there were time I could go into them, which have created some really marvelous things in very poor uh, working class, mostly Mexican communities. Things like that are happening. So there's all sorts of, there's a lot of positive developments going on. Actually, we see that in the midst of the, cri the coronavirus crisis. There are communities, poor communities that are just organizing, self-organizing. Uh, let's figure out a way to get food to this uh, elderly disabled person who's off in a room somewhere. Uh, people helping each other, coming together. Uh, that's, and of course, there's this amazing model of the, the nurses and doctors that are working heroically under uh, awful conditions imposed on them by a really malevolent government. Um, but nevertheless, putting it aside, working in dangerous conditions, uh, day and night, uh, front lines, these are real models of what can be done. And uh, so I think all around, I think there's lots of sense of opportunity that can be grasped, uh, as happened in the 30s. We've just changed the country, changed it enormously. The effect lasted essentially up to Reagan. You know, uh, there's so many ways we could go with uh, your answer there, but I, I think that, you know, to build on a couple of your points, the 1920s, as you point out, was terrible for labor, unions decimated, and that's pretty similar to today. The, you know, since the 1980s, the union movement has shrunk, worker power has lessened, and we today see unions at their weakest point since the 1920s. But as you also point out, the 1930s are a period of hope. And I agree with you that there is a sense oftentimes of hopelessness. I see this sometimes with my students. Uh, I see this uh, with, as you point out, the responses to the Sanders campaign, that it is a huge victory in many, many ways. And yet there is this feeling of what do we do now? And I agree with you that this is part of that neoliberal shift and this kind of individualism that has stopped in some ways bringing us together. But we are seeing today also a huge amount of people coming together, supporting each other in the ways that you describe. Now, one difference between 1933 and 2020 is that you remember your parents listening to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And today we have Donald Trump tweeting. So to what, uh, uh, you know, so I guess, how do we as people desperate to make a better life for ourselves and our family and our nation, how do we approach this political question in 2020? 
uh, the first point, which is essential and to my mind so trivial that I don't understand why anybody's even talking about it is to get rid of the malignancy in the White House, which is unbelievable. I don't think it has a counterpart in political history. Uh, the, you know, there's plenty of terrible things, but at least the presidents were half human. You, know, you could imagine you know, pressuring them and it was even done like you know Nixon and Reagan, I, I mean, no words for it but they were susceptible to public pressure. There are very good examples of that. I don't think that's true of Trump. This is a sociopathic uh, buffoon who's interested in only one thing in the world, himself, which means, as he understands, placating his primary constituency, which is wealth, extreme wealth and corporate power, knows if he pour money into their pockets, they'll let you get away with your antics, uh, even if they don't like them. That he understands. And the rest, you have to give him credit for it. He's probably the most effective con man ever to have appeared in political history. And he makes P.T. Barnum look like a total amateur. The guy who was selling you the Brooklyn Bridge couldn't come near. Somehow he's managing you know, to hold up a banner in one hand saying, I love you, I'm your savior, I'm the one person who's going to rescue from you from disaster. On the other hand, he's stabbing in the back with every single legislative action and proposal. That's quite an achievement. Uh, and I uh, want to go back to childhood memories. Some of my childhood memories are listening to the radio to the Nuremberg rallies, Hitler's Nuremberg rallies. Late 30s. I don't understand the words, but the mood and the uh, nature of the crowd and the, the screaming and support for this angry mob you know, ready to destroy everything. Now that you couldn't miss even as a six year old kid. And in fact, the first article I wrote that I remember back in, in 1939 was uh, about the seemingly inexorable spread of fascism over Europe. Nazis took over Austria, took over Czechoslovakia. I was writing right after the fall of Barcelona, and they took over Spain. It seemed like it was never going to end. Uh, when I look, I don't want to compare Hitler with Trump. That's unfair to Hitler. Uh, Hitler had an ideology, a horrifying ideology, but at least he was there. Not just me, 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 you know, anything, I'll kill anybody around as long as it helps me. That I wasn't hit. You know, but the mood sometimes looks similar. So right now, for example, when uh, you know, armed crowds are uh, uh, surrounding the uh, legislature and uh, with their corporate sponsors fighting them, funding them, and Trump is telling them, yeah, go ahead and adding, don't forget your Second Amendment rights. Totally irrelevant to the issue, but pushing the button, as a good con man knows. Get your guns and defend them. You know. uh, it does resonate, different in many ways, but resonates. So there's several things you can remember from the 30s. You can remember how it turned out also. Not pretty. Uh, but, uh, and it's worth bearing in mind that in the 1920s, the Germany was the most civilized part of the Western world. It was the center of the arts, of the sciences, of literature. It was regarded widely as the model for democracy. And 10 years later, it was the depths of human history. Uh, we can bear that in mind as well. And, uh, uh, Remember. So there's a lot to remember from the 30s and the years since. Uh, but for now, the right, the labor movement had been destroyed, but it picked up militantly. And we may be seeing signs of that today. Uh, in my lifetime, this is about the first time since the 30s that 
young people even knew what May Day is. I mean, one of the geniuses of American propaganda has been to absolutely wipe out the history of American labor struggles. I mean, May Day is an international day of support for American workers' struggles, celebrated everywhere in the world. Here, nobody knows what it is. And it's Law Day. It's uh, I remember, you know, I've been in, I remember being in Europe shortly after the fall of Franco was in Spain, happened to be there on, in May. On May Day, I had to decide which of two huge demonstrations of the CNT, the anarchist labor movement, which of the two demonstrations of the anarchist labor movement does it attend on May Day? Okay, that's a couple of years after Franco. Okay. Uh, here it's been wiped out of memory. Uh, there's a thing called Labor Day, which is the day when you celebrate going back to work. That's, uh, that's really an amazing propaganda achievement, but it's being overcome. People are learning about it. Today, there are strikes all over the place. Uh, some of them are really important. I'll take the Amazon workers. I mean, they're about the most miserably treated workers you can imagine. And it's not their first strike. A couple of years, a couple of months ago, I forget exactly when, maybe a year ago, there was a major strike threat by Amazon workers, which had an effect. Uh, Jeff Bezos, you know, richest guy in the world, he runs it, uh, shifted position on climate change. He said, yeah, he's going to give, I think, kind of what, $10 million or something. It's petty change for him to uh, uh, work on climate, on ending uh, global warming, restricting global warming. He's going to turn Amazon into a, a zero emissions company. So that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Even not only governments, but corporations are susceptible to threat uh, in rising uh, popular activism. As you can see, it's very striking that at one of the most important meetings that takes place every year, Davos in Switzerland, every January, the people who call themselves the masters of the universe, they get together to go skiing and have parties and tell each other how wonderful they are and so on. It's uh, uh, the CEOs of major corporations, or media magnates, you know, that kind of type. This year was different, it was very interestingly different. There was a, the, the mood was, look, we've got to tell the public that we made bad mistakes. Uh, the neoliberal programs really did hurt them. We were looking after our own profits. That was bad. We recognize that. We're now changing. You remember this declaration of the couple hundred CEOs who said, yeah, we realized we were bad guys. Now we're going to be really good people, humanists. Uh, we're going to work for you. You can trust us. Now put your face in our hands because we've changed. Actually, I'm old enough to remember an earlier part of this. You may recall in the 1950s, the idea was uh, what was called soulful corporations. The corporations are not just out for profit and market share, they're soulful. They really care about the important things in the world. So let's trust them and so on. Uh, 60 years to see how soulful they were. But now the mood is coming back and not just be out of their goodness of their hearts. They're feeling the pressure. Now they see the peasants and the pitchforks famous in it, and they know they better do something about it. Actually, there was a, the meetings in Davos opened with the most fantastic 10 or 15 minutes I've ever seen in my life. It should just be shown over and over everywhere, every classroom, every public meeting. And the Davos meetings opened with two keynote addresses. Now, the first one, of course, is Donald Trump, you know, the master of the world. Now, they don't like him. His vulgarity, his uh, pretentiousness, uh, they don't 
like it at all. Uh, for one thing, it interferes with their image of the humanism and soulful, soulfulness and so on. But they applauded him raucously after a crazy rant about you know, what a genius he is and how awful everyone is and so on. But they all applauded, standing applause. Why? Because he understands something that they understand. What's important, what doesn't matter what the antics are. What's important is to remember that you funnel the wealth of the world into the right pockets. He understands that. They understand it. So the rest of it we can put aside. Okay, after this comical tragedy of a couple of minutes, came the next speaker, Greta Thunberg, a young girl, gave a quiet, careful talk, factually accurate, uh, very straightforward, ending up with saying, you are betraying us, you in the audience out there. Uh, there was polite applause, but the general feeling was you're a nice little girl, uh, go back to school, and uh, let us take care of the serious things in the world. It's very striking, it tells you a lot about the modern world, right there encapsulated. And uh, it's not just Greta Thunberg, it's all these kids who went out on the climate strike. It's a, a major event last October, uh, extension, uh, extension Rebellion and others all over the place. A sunrise movement, a bunch of young kids who were working on trying to stop destruction of the environment. They went as far as uh, occupying uh, offices in Congress, got support from young legislators who came in on the Sanders wave, Alexandria, Casio Cortez, namely uh, Ed Markey, uh, Senator from Massachusetts, who's been in concerned about environmental issues, joined in. Uh, they managed to get the some kind of Green New Deal program on the legislative agenda. It's a tremendous achievement. We need something like that to survive, some form or other, some kind of Green New Deal type pro national program. A couple of years ago, it was if it was mentioned at all, it was ridiculed. Now it's in the center of attention. That's another amazing achievement of the activism of the last couple of years. It's the kind of thing that can be done. It's kind of pathetic that it's the young people in the world who are in the forefront, not our generation, which should be. She's right when she said, Greta Thunberg, you betrayed us. We should be doing it. Uh, the burden should not be on young people saddled with immense debt, uh, no jobs, and so on. But they're the ones doing it. Uh, now I think maybe today we'll see a revived labor movement joining with them. Uh, that could make a huge difference. Uh, all the young kids who feel depressed shouldn't. They should be saying, we've got a great opportunity now. Uh, we're way better off than people in the past who struggled against the most worse odds. Uh, we're not uh, freedom riders uh, riding through Alabama uh, to try to get a black farmer to be willing to face the lynch mobs and vote and getting shot and killed ourselves. It's not that now. Uh, young people did it. They were in the forefront of the, of the civil rights movement. Uh, uh, important movement, Martin Luther King was very important, but He'd have been the first one to tell you that it was the snake workers on the ground, you know, the black students who were sitting in on lunch counters, others like them who were forging the way, who were riding the way. That's what's happening now, I'm afraid. Revived labor movement could make a huge difference. Uh, and I think we're at a moment, you know, the coronavirus, coronavirus has sort of created a, a situation of sharp class conflict of a kind I haven't seen for a long time. Uh, the guys who own and run the world, they don't stop. They're relentless. They go on all the time. Right now, they're working very hard to try to ensure that what comes out of this crisis will be a harsher form 
of the neoliberal plate. They're spending all, we can go through the details, what they're doing. Question is, what's everyone else going to do? Okay. Are they going to let this happen? Or are they going to use the power that's in the hands of the government to change things? And a lot has happened, not just domestically, internationally as well. Of course, it doesn't get any publicity. We're not going to read about it in the newspaper. But on uh, about a week from now, I think May 11th, will be the first international meeting of a progressive international. It was initiated by Bernie Sanders in the United States and uh, Yanis Varoufakis in Europe, a very important economist and political activist who founded the M25 movement, a Europe-wide movement that's organizing throughout the continent to try to salvage whatever is of any value in the European Union, and there are some good things. So let's save them and get rid of the rot, which is corrupting, destroying. Uh, so they're getting together to form a progressive international, which is a conscious effort, an accurate effort to counter something that's being organized in Washington. You don't read about it in the press, but out of the sort of chaos of the Trump White House, you can detect some geostrategic thinking. But one of them is to form an international alliance of the most reactionary, oppressive states in the world, run by the White House in the Western Hemisphere, it would include people like uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, who's a right-wing thug who's destroying Brazil, whose model is Trump, the uh, Middle East, uh, and people like uh, MBS, the brutal killer who's now running Saudi Arabia, the ugly, brutal dictatorship, uh, the United Arab Emirates, another brutal family dictatorship, uh, the Sisi's Egypt, the worst dictatorship in uh, Egypt's history. Trump says it's his best friend. And, uh, Israel is so far to the right, you can't even see it anymore. He's now openly joining what had been tacit relations in the past. Uh, India, under Modi, uh, is trying to install a right-wing Hindu nationalist state, which will wipe out Indian secular democracy. Uh, Europe, you get to uh, Orban turning Hungary into a dictatorship. Uh, the right-wing elements of Italy, like Salvini, who want to murder uh, refugees fleeing in misery from Africa, let them drown at sea, and so on. So put all that together, you get a powerful reactionary inter international. The progressive international is an effort to counter it, very much like the conflict here, magnified to an international arena. These are things that are going on all over the world, in one form or another. And what comes out of it will make a huge difference. Uh, the coronavirus is focusing attention on these possibilities. We are going to be entering a different world. And the question is, which one will it be? There are contending forces. We can take a stand and do something about it. I want to... Uh... Uh, thank you for that. I, I want to combine, we have some great questions uh, from the audience and I wanna kind of build on those uh, and ask you a couple of questions. So um, Gloria uh, notes, uh, quote, divide and conquer has been used successfully for centuries. How can we best fight against divide and conquer? And it, that question reminds me of things that you have been saying um, about you know, your past and the history of American labor and, you know, and, and Trump in that in the 1930s, the forefront of the American labor movement was largely immigrant it, or, or immigrants children. It was Jewish, it was Polish, it was Italian, you know, these- African-American. And African-American and in the Southwest, Mexican-American. Which was very important, you know, there were, sharp racist divisions. I can remember from childhood in Philadelphia, where I lived, we were the only Jewish family in a 
Irish German neighborhood. Yeah. It was pretty ugly. I went to Hebrew school, which I had to take the subway. Okay. To get from the subway to the Hebrew school, you had to have police protection, literally. When you got back on the subway, you were on your own. In fact, it was so serious that in the, the city at one point imposed a 7 p.m. turf curfew on teenagers to try to keep down race conflicts. Mm -hmm. At the same time in the labor movement, they were working together. The racial conflicts were overcome as soon as he started organizing the CIO and carrying out militant actions. The same thing had happened as a better night in the 1890s. And then the racism against the Huns, and anybody from Eastern Europe was a Hun. Uh, the Irish were treated like dogs. But as the labor movement began to develop in Western Pennsylvania and elsewhere, it became very strong. This was gone. They worked together. They had common goals and aims. And I think that's the hope today. Uh, well, and and uh, many of these workers today uh, who are leading the resistance are people working for Amazon, working in these meat packing plants, getting sick from coronavirus. And who are they? They are African-American. They are Mexican. They are Guatemalan. They are Somali. And so, you know, in, in terms of Gloria's question about divide and conquer, like today, or like in the past, we have a very diverse workforce. Donald Trump comes to power in part by, by breaking apart a sense of solidarity between workers of different races. So how do we overcome this divide and conquer world that has made class solidarity so difficult? He's not the only one. Let's go back to Reagan, who was nowhere near, not my favorite person, but nowhere near as malevolent as the White House malignancy. But where did he start his 1980 campaign? He picked a town in Mississippi, tiny small town, which was known for only one thing, the murder of civil rights workers. And of course, the Republican Party says, oh, that was just an accident. You know? uh, his first uh, speeches began with uh, the welfare queens, uh, these black studs uh, coming to the welfare office in their limousines uh, to, with their 15 children to, uh, to steal your welfare and so on. You know what he was doing. You have to, it's very important if you're gonna stab people in the back to get them to turn to something else like hating the guy next to me. Uh, Trump understands that too. He's not an idiot. He's a good political operator on that. So yes, let's try to get people to hate each other. But what's the wall about? I mean, putting, like you look at his latest budget, which is interesting to look at, more money for the wall. Uh, everything is the wall uh, because they are coming after us. You know, Who is they? You know, the miserable people fleeing uh, from the fact that, from the destruction that we caused in their countries, uh, right up to the present. Uh, a couple of years, a year or two ago, the main flood of refugees was from Honduras, uh, where there was a military coup that overthrew a mildly reformist government. And Obama and Clinton were the only ones in the hemisphere virtually to support it. They said they didn't, but if you look, they supported it. And now people turned into a horror chamber, everybody's fleeing. So we have to protect ourselves from them. You know? This is just a way of finding, finding somebody to blame. Now, she's doing it at every level. Uh, take a look right now at the attack on China. I mean, if you take a look at the details, it collapses instantly. Go through if you have to. But the most striking thing is he's lashing out at the World Health Organization. Totally fabricated charges, but they have an effect which amazingly isn't being discussed, even in the liberal press. You defund the World, World Health Organization. What happens in Africa? Huge numbers of people die who are being kept alive by the services provided by the World, World Health Organization. So here's a 
gangster in the White House who says, I'll kill lots of people in Africa if this will help me uh, uh, push a button for my voting base and help me get elected. And you think of, I'm not going to think of plenty of mass murderers in, in history. Anybody who did it for something like that, and it passes without comment. Uh, the same thing's going on with the ploy with the governors. He's turning to the piece, flailing about desperately to find somebody to blame for his criminality. I mean, tens of thousands of Americans died because he, he refused to do anything in the first couple of months while everybody else was trying to counter the virus. Okay, so you got to cover up for that. So you find somebody to blame. Now it's the governors, especially as Mitch McConnell says, the blue state government again. Uh, they committed a crime. Uh, they uh, paid, they wasted their money on uh, pensions for uh, firefighters and policemen and teachers. Now that they wasted that money, we're not going to give them anything. Uh, okay. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the airline industries, uh, which uh, uh, spent the glory years buying back stocks to instead of improving the services of the enterprise uh, to inflate the wealth of their rich shareholders and get the CEO a salary to fly into the stratosphere that uh, will pay them in fact exactly the amount that they lost okay uh, and then the federal government Trump turns to the states and says we can't help you we happen to have all the resources uh, we have all the wealth the facilities that uh, we can make arrangements with other countries things you can't do but it's your problem okay so you governors you try to deal with it. well it's going to lead to catastrophes and then trump can say your fault it'll be repeated on fox news their fault uh, the democrats if anything happens at work uh, trump can say look what a great genius i am greatest genius in history it worked and uh, sean hannity will give a talk on fox news saying you're the greatest figure since uh, god created the world and so on uh, uh, this scam will continue going on all for personal gain the effects on the american population on the world doesn't matter it's like uh, turning to something else uh, tearing up the uh, Iran nuclear deal, which was in fact working very well. American intelligence said, it's living up to it. But you have to tear it apart. Why? So it can look as if you're doing something. It was Obama's deal, so we have to destroy it. And that's, and it was the worst deal in history because Obama did it. The best thing to do, but they're all wrong. I'm right. I'm going to tear it up. Leading to sharp increase in tensions, uh, conditions which could break out into a major war would be devastating. Uh, then imposing sanctions, which are harsh and brutal and totally illegitimate. And when Iran is suffering from a pandemic, in large part for internal reasons, make it worse by strangling them with extra sanction to make sure that people suffer as much as possible for my benefit. Things like this are going on everywhere. It's, it's hard to find words for it. The malevolent is nearly near strong enough. I can't think of good ones. Uh, and worse than all of this, overshadowing all of it, by far, are Trump's, is Trump's extraordinary dedication to destroying the prospects for human life on Earth. And that is not an exaggeration. His massive efforts to increase the use of fossil fuels, to cut back any controls on them. Uh, this is the worst crime in history, literally. It's going to make life on Earth impossible and within a couple of generations. Thunberg was right. You betrayed us by letting this happen. He's in the forefront. You can find a couple other minor figures in the world, but nobody else is even close. I should add that there's something else, which for some reason, which amazes me, nobody wants to talk about. 
Trump is tearing to shreds the arms control agreements, which offered some limited protection against the terminal nuclear war, tearing them apart one after the other. Reagan's INF Treaty, gone. Uh, Eisenhower's Open Skies Treaty on the chopping block. Uh, the New START Treaty is not going to make pretty clear they're not going to sign it. That's the end. No constraints anymore on uh, other countries uh, uh, developing mass we weapons of destruction to destroy us. Yeah, let's have that. Great for the arms manufacturers here. They love it. They're exulting. They get huge contracts to build weapons and destroy everything, and then more contracts to try to figure out ways to stop other countries from developing. Now, what fate of the world? Who, who cares? You know, it uh, doesn't, doesn't matter. I'm doing it for me. You know. These things are going on before our eyes. Uh, if we don't do something to stop them, in a generation or two, it'll be all over. Well, I think one of the, you know, we have, we have about 10 minutes left. So maybe a kind of last question or next to last question um, and to kind of build on some of the, uh, the Q&A as well is, you know, we are facing coronavirus like climate change is both an environmental disaster and a human disaster. That these environmental disasters show the inequality of human society, who lives and who dies, who suffers and who escapes that suffering. So how do you think going forward that we can best as everyday people put pressure on our government and organize as citizens to fight this specter of climate change that as you point out threatens the future of life on earth and how do we fight the big corporations who are who are making sure that nothing gets done to fight that climate change the way young people are doing it and go beyond so take right now uh, the major criminals on environmental catastrophe are the fossil fuel industries now, take a look at the oil price the government could buy them out and dismantle them, not in a day, They'd still need fossil fuels for the transition period. But they could be socialized, taken over by the government, subject to popular control and influence, and there could be moves to slowly put them out of business, replace them by renewable energy. But actually, they know how to do it, like uh, Chevron, major company. Uh, had a small subsidiary which was working on sustainable energy. It was actually quite profitable. They closed it down because they can make more profit uh, selling fossil fuels to destroy the world. Now that's there's a simple word for that. It's called capitalism. Yeah, they were right. That's the way you behave in a capitalist society. A popular organized society under democratic control, concerned with people and not profits, could make different decisions. Like maybe we want our grandchildren to survive. So let's take over the fossil fuel industries, uh, put them under popular control, workers control, community control, move to sh shift the balance so that instead of fossil fuels, they pursue the renewable energy okay, under our control. You can say this across the board. But what about the big banks? What are they doing here? I mean, they're uh, after one of Obama's worst actions was in 2008. Congressional legislation that came along saying uh, you have to bail out the banks who are the perpetrators of the crisis. And you have to, uh, the legislation said, you have to provide aid to the victims the people who were kicked out of their homes with foreclosures under the you know, Clinton, Rubin, uh, Summers scam of uh, eliminating the uh, regulations. Which part of the legislation was implemented? Okay. The first part, second. Happening again right now. Why is the stimulus going to the banks? 
In fact, should the banks even be allowed to function the way they are? Maybe we ought to have uh, public banks, which are banks. You go back to the 50s and the 60s, before the neoliberal play. Banks were banks. If you had some extra cash, you put it in the bank. If they lent it out to somebody who was you know, trying to put his kid through college, buy a car. With the neoliberal play, banks changed radically. Financial institutions pretty much took over the country. I mean, their economic contribution is probably negative, certainly not positive. Well, why should they be there? Why should we have hedge funds? Why should we have private equity? Why should we have huge banks uh, which uh, are carrying out scams to harm the population and enrich, enrich the shareholders and managers? Well, there's plenty of opportunities. And the stimulus money, instead of going to the banks to distribute whatever the way they like with the Mnuchin uh, looking over their shoulder to make sure that they're honest. Yeah, tell me another story. Well, why not have the money go straight to the people who need it? The working people, the people in trouble, people who can't pay their rent. Uh, in fact, why not have a rent strike that's being proposed? Let the stimulus go there to the people who need it and build the country instead of going to the huge institutions which have been destroying the country. I mean, all of these things are within the range of possibilities. Now let's, I'm sure, let's just take a quick look at the Sanders campaign and see the way it's portrayed in the liberal press, the left part of the liberal press, far left as you can go. What are Sanders's two main policies? One, universal health care. The other, free higher education. Now look at the commentary in the left press. Good ideas, but the country is not ready for them. I mean, that is an insult to the country of a kind that you'd expect from its worst enemies. Now, what is he saying? Can you think of a country that has universal health care? Can you think of one that doesn't have it? It's everywhere. Well, rich countries, poor countries have some form of universal health care. Well, free higher education, all over the place. Uh, Germany, Finland, and Mexico, everywhere you look. In fact, as we were saying before the program started, here in the United States we had it. Uh, when I went to school to college, it was essentially free. I was going to an Ivy League college, $100, and you could get a scholarship easily. The GI Bill of Rights came along. Free, higher public education for huge numbers of people who had never gone to college, even subsidizing them. And very good for them, very good for the country. So what Sanders is saying is, let's see if we can rise to the level of other countries and of what we once were. That's radical, that's revolutionary, uh, too much for the country to tolerate. I mean, it shows you how much a kind of sensible, left liberal culture has just eroded. Uh, we ought to be saying, hey, this is obvious, we don't bother talking about it. Of course we do that. Then let's go on to something else. Like if you give, uh, if you decide to fund some enterprise for their misdeeds, uh, put conditions on it. Say they have to put workers on the board. They have to, have to, uh, they have to make sure they commit themselves never to have have any more buybacks. That was illegal pre-Reagan. No more tax shelters. Illegal pre-Reagan. Uh, have a, live, insist on a livable wage. You don't do that, you're out of business. We can do that. That's a step towards what could go on beyond that. The point is, as we've been talking about all along, plenty of things within range, plenty of things that can be done. It just requires uh, liberating yourself from the suffocating ideological controls of the neoliberal age. It's not hard. It just means opening your eyes, looking at what's around you. And it can be done. It can change the world. It was done in the 30s. It can be done now. Yeah. And that's, that's an incredibly inspiring way for us to move toward our conclusion. I think that 
in the next few months, we're going to probably be seeing serious rent strikes as the poverty that COVID-19 creates is going to really take people uh, into a desperate scenario. We're going to see increased worker struggle. We are going to see a greater move toward organizing. And I want people to remember as we leave that the 1929 Great Depression started in 1929. It took five years for the big strikes of 1934 to begin to truly transform America. Organizing is happening. It maybe it's not always going to happen right now, but we are seeing the beginnings of what I think certainly is the growth of a revived left movement that is going to move us toward greater equality. And that requires all of us having hope and participating and moving forward with that instead of buying into that neoliberal sense of individualism and hopelessness that Professor Chomsky has spent the last hour teaching us. And so I wanted to thank Professor Chomsky for his time. We don't want to go over. Of course, he has many other obligations. Uh, and so I wanted uh, uh, finally to urge all of you to check out more radical labor books from the new press and more great Radical May programs at radicalmay.liberal, uh, or excuse, excuse me, not liberal, <laughs> excuse me, radicalmay.literalbcn.cat, or just Google Radical May. Stay safe, organize with your neighbors and coworkers, and help build a better world coming out of this crisis. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you.